It is a great honor to give this lecture and contribute with Comrade Curious at this extremely important summer school, which is dedicated to training cadres of the International Committee of the Fourth International around the world on the basis of assimilating the lessons of a critical period in the history of the Trotskyist movement and preparing them for the tasks ahead. Comrades, this lecture deals with the most consequential struggle waged within the International Committee of the Fourth International against a determined attempt to destroy Trotskyism as a tendency. This campaign of political and organizational destruction involved what were then its most internationally respected leaders. The very survival of the 14th International was at stake. As was stressed in Comrade David North's opening remarks to the 2019 party school, quote, except for the International Committee, the movement founded by Leon Trotsky had been politically liquidated by the Pabloites. In all the countries where the Pabloites had been able to establish organizational control, they had destroyed the Trotsky organizations by turning them into political appendages of the Stalinist, social democratic, or bourgeois nationalist organizations. By 1985, the Workers' Revolutionary Party, which had by that point capitulated to populism, was close to completing the same breaking operation." End quote. This lecture will explore in detail the observation by Comrade David that follows. Quote, of course, efforts would have been made to sustain and rebuild the Trotskyist movement. I am certain that there would have been in all the sections of the International Committee Comrades devoted to Trotskyism, who remained determined to rebuild the Fourth International. But their efforts would have been burdened by the disorientation that would have followed the collapse of the WRP, had there not been a highly developed analysis of the underlying causes of the 1985 crisis. In fact, it was the existence of the detailed written critique developed by the leadership of the Workers' League between 1982 and 1984, of Jerry Healy's theoretical charlatanry, and the WRP's capitulation to Pabloite revisionism that refuted Cliff Slaughter's cynical lie that the WRP's political crisis was just one element of the echo degeneration of the entire International Committee, end quote. We will make clear why the attempt to destroy the ICFI failed and instead led to a decisive victory of the Orthodox Trotskys, providing the basis for a global renaissance of revolutionary socialism and confirming the ICFI is its sole contemporary representative. Jerry Healy, Cliff Slaughter, and Michael Banda had enormous political authority within the ICFI. Between 19, 1961 and 1964, the British Trotskyists had led the struggle against the unprincipled reunification of the US Socialist Workers' Party with the Pabloites, producing documents that we still use to educate our cadre. The unprincipled reunification in 1963 dealt a serious blow to the Trotskyist movement. Under conditions where the Pabloites were liquidating promising movements around the world and subordinating them to anti Marxist tendencies, Trotskyist principles were defended primarily by the Socialist Labour League in Britain with the support of the OCI in France. The subsequent political struggle of the SLL against Stalinism, social democracy, bourgeois nationalism, and its Pabloite apologists laid the foundation for the Workers' League in the United States and the Revolutionary Communist League in Sri Lanka. This was especially through the opposition 
to the historic Great, great Betrayal in Sri Lanka in 1964, when the Lanka Samaya Party joined the Bushiva coalition government of Sirimavo Bandaranaike. Previous speakers have explained how the SLL retreated from the fight against Pabloism. From around 1967, the British Trotskyists began to adapt themselves to the enormous political and social pressures bearing down on the moment. Under conditions where the political domination of social democracy, Stalinism, Maoism, Castroism, and other anti Marxist forces demanded relentless struggle against revisionism and for internationalism, the conception developed that prioritizing the building of a Trotskyist party in Britain above all by establishing a daily paper to rival the Stanis Morning Star would provide the necessary inspiration for building other sections. We have defined this as a turn to tactical opportunism, a, a historical and nationalist approach, and it proved to be disastrous. It meant focusing on national tasks and withdrawing from the fight against opportunism and revisionism, and for the perspective of building the ICFI as the world party of socialist revolution. This led the WRP to an increasingly Pabloite orientation and threatened the very existence of the International Committee. This was a long political process, as is explained in how the WRP betrayed Trotskyism Quote, it is, of course, not possible to ascertain the moment the degeneration began. At any rate, such processes do not proceed in a straight line. There are days when even a dying man displays a vigor that astonishes his family and friends. But there can be no doubt that the political decay of the WRP was inseparably bound up with its turn away from the international struggle against revisionism, the theoretical main, mainspring of building the World Party in the early 1970s. The first serious political consequences of the SLL's withdrawal from the struggle against Pabloism was manifested in its response to the centrist degeneration of the OCI in France and the split that followed in July 1971. In the struggle against unprincipled unification in 1963, the SLL systematically addressed important questions of perspective and produced critical documents assisting in the development of a pro-ICFI faction within the SWP. This time, the SLL moved quickly to an organizational break citing differences over the dialectical materialism rather than opposing the centrist political turn by the OCI. Healy was reluctant to wage such an exhaustive struggle because he feared this would cut across the practical interventions of the SLL into the emerging crisis in Britain. His fears were amplified by the fact that positions like the OCI's had been voiced at the 1966 World Congress by Slaughter, who had initially supported the OCI's formulation on reconstructing the Fourth International. For his part, Banda had evinced a political fascination for figures such as Mao, Ho Chi Minh, and Jamal Abdel Nasser. Under conditions of a deepening crisis of world capitalism and an expansion of the party mem party's membership, the failure to draw the lessons of the split with the OCI and to put the historical foundations of the Trotskyist movement at the center of its work accelerated the SLL's national opportunist orientation. The intensification of the class struggle in the early 1970s produced a major political adaptation to the anti-Tory movement by the SLL and 
a retreat from focusing on the building of the fort in Dimension. As comrades Evan Blake and Tom McCammon have reviewed in detail, that period was a critical turning point in the different trajectories of the workers' sake in the US and the British Trotskys. Although the WRP leaders had supported the workers' sake in the fight against Walford, they had failed to draw the necessary lessons from this critical experience, not only for the workers' sake, but the entire international community. This was reflected in the fact that the WRP didn't write a single important statement on Walford, as Comrade North emphasized. By contrast, the Workers' League placed the history of the Trotskyist movement and the lessons of the struggle against Pabloism at the center of its political work. Founding the Workers' Revolutionary Party in 1973 was done based on national considerations without any discussion with the International Committee. Its stated aim was to bring to power a labor government pledged to socialist policies. The WRP's past record of political struggle against Pabloism, including that which was positive and correct regarding the struggle against the centrist degeneration of the OCI, and the British Comrades' defense of a Marxist analysis of capitalism crisis, nevertheless continued to provide a political inspiration internationally. This led to the formation of NIF sections in Germany and Australia. But its turn away from an internationalist axis and to intensify collaboration with its political co thinkers opened a protracted period of political disorientation that gave way to grotesque political opportunism and betrayal. How the WRP betrayed Trotskyism explains that having founded the WRP on the struggle to bring down the Tories and return a Labour government, the party lost influence with the hundreds of workers attracted to it on, the, on that basis who had not been educated in Trotsky's principles. Its leadership was compelled to redefine its program and placed renewed emphasis on the, its Trotsky's identity and opposition to labor. But this met opposition from a substantial section of workers recruited on a centrist basis, led by Alan Thornet, the British Leyland car worker and secretary of the party's All Trade Unions Alliance. This right wing attack was led secretly by OCI with the aim of removing, removing Heli as leader. The International Committee was not involved in the conflict with Thorne, and he was dealt with through bureaucratic expulsions. The intervention of the IC would have fundamentally changed the political dynamic. By resuming the struggle against OCI and the resurgence of Pabloite revisionism, represented by Thorne's right centrist line, the WRP leadership would have politically rearmed the world movement in the face of the sharp shift that was emerging in the political situation internationally. Instead, the WRP made an ultra left turn, calling on the working class to overthrow the Labour government. Workers near doing so at this stage could only possibly result in bringing the Tories back to power. The call reflected and deepened a class shift taking place within the party. Having already lost a substantial section of its working class base, the WRP was making a fundamental programmatic break with the proletarian orientation it had historically fought for. This found support within a leadership increasingly dominated by petty bourgeois forces with no real connection to the party's historical history of political struggle, such as actors Vanessa and Corinne Redgrave 
and new sign editor Alex Michel. They responded impatiently and without the necessary theoretical grounding to the political development of the working class. The opportunist essence of this ultra left deviation emerged most clearly in the abandonment of the theory of per permanent revolution and the strategy of world socialist revolution. In April 1976, the WRP signed an agreement with the Libyan government behind back of the International Committee that began the transformation of the WRP into a paid propagandist and political agent of the Arab bourgeoisie. Over the next years, the dangerous growth of the political influence of middle class layers within the party leadership became a transmission belt for the penetration of alien class interests into the WRP. It was they who supported a series of political shifts from ultra left ultimatism to grotesque adaptations to sections of the labor and trade union bureaucracy. They also provided a substantial source of revenue, not based on the struggle to penetrate the working class. This deepened the leadership's independence from and hostility towards the party's rank and file and hastened the destruction of the foundations of democratic centralism. This disastrous impact internationally is described in this remarkable passage from how the workers revolutionary party betrayed Trotskyism. Quote, the predominant expression of this betrayal of Trotskyism was the subordination of the interest of the world socialist revolution to the immediate practical needs of the British organization. The growth of chauvinism within the WRP expressed the direct pressure of British imperialism upon the party, above all its leadership. Philly, Banda and Slaughter came to look upon and threat the International Committee as if it formed part of a mini commonwealth dominated by the WRP to be used as a source of finance and to be manipulated in its interests of its foreign policy. By the 1980s, the methods through which they dominated the International Committee began to resemble those practices used for centuries by the British ruling class. Perjury by day and forgery by night. And we mean this literally. End quote. This political backsliding and toxic nationalism determined the WRP's response to the criticisms formulated by Comrade David North between 1982 and 1984, threatening the workers' sick with a split and preventing their circulation and discussion in the IC. Because of this, the WRP leadership had placed itself on course for a political shipwreck. February 1984 offered an essential opportunity for the WRP to objectively confront the political and theoretical questions underlying its decade-long degeneration, which it rejected. One month later, the miners' strike erupted. This was the greatest class battle in Britain since the general strike of 1926, spanning an, an entire year. It saw 20,000 miners injured or hospitalized, 13,000 arrested, 200 miners imprisoned during the brutal military-style police operations, two miners killed on picket lines, and Three killed digging for coal during digging for coal during the winter, and 966 miners sacked. 
the National Union of My Workers assets were sequestered and the Scrap Union of Democratic Mine Workers set up in a state operation. The strike's defeat was followed by mass pit closures and the decimation of the entire communities. It was a struggle that confirmed the utter political decay of the WRP and helped precipitate the explosion that followed. The WRP's political line was a mixture of ultra-left rhetoric and rampant opportunism. It never once placed a single demand on the Labour Party. Its substitute demands for a general strike to install a workers' revolutionary government or calls to mobilize the working class to force the resignation of the Tory government, new elections and return of the Labour Party to power on a socialist program. This would have placed the party in a position to win thousands of socialist-minded workers to a revolutionary alternative. To fill the gap between the WRP's refusal to demand that the Trade Union Congress and the Labour Party bring down the Tory government and its propaganda campaign for a workers' revolutionary government, the party claimed that Margaret Thatcher's government had been transformed into, into a Bonapartist dictatorship. This supposedly meant that the ruling class no longer relied on the bureaucracy to police and suppress the class struggle. Instead, a revolutionary situation had emerged, placing the WRP in a direct struggle for power without the need to break the grip of the labor and trade union bureaucracy over the working class. Granting dictatorial powers to Thatcher provided an apologia for the betrayals. Betrayals of the Labour Party, Labour and Trade Union bureaucracy that follow that would be the real source of the miners' defeat. The refusal of the WRB to challenge the TUC and Labour Party and urging only trade union militancy facilitated the party's subordination to the National Union of Mine Workers, bureaucracy led by Stanis Arthur Scargill. It was Scargill who was tasked with insulating and protecting the labor bureaucracy from political challenge. For a membership that was politically uneducated, and involved every day in intense activity during the strike, it appeared for a time that the WRP was making great strides, especially in winning the support of the most militant miners. But with the strike's defeat, these apparent gains evaporated. The WRP's response was criminal to account for the failure of the strikes and to be followed by the imposition of fascist dictatorship as predicted at the party's 7th Congress in December 1984. The WRP proclaimed that the miners had been, quote, betrayed but not defeat, end quote. In response to the pressure from the membership, especially in, in the North, the release the jail miners' marches were launched. The hope was to consume the membership in activism with Banda referencing Mao's long march and declaring that the party would be marching until the revolution. The march won significant support among miners and other workers. I think this clip from the WRP's release the jail, release the jailed miners film shows what would have been possibly possible for the party to achieve as it sought to draw the lessons for the working class from this experience rather than continuing to tail Cargill and the National Union of Mine Workers. But the last 12 months has taught us anything, it's taught us how to fight, and that's all we've got. We know how to fight, we've got to fight for these men, and we're going to have to fight even if the, if the Labour government gets in next time, we're still going to have to fight.
Uh, other than that, we've got to keep publicity going. We've not got to um, just sit back and write a letter to them and uh, send a food parcel and make a donation about once every few weeks to the families. That's not enough. They need publicity. They need We the Women on marches. They need as much publicity as they can get to ensure that their men should be free. They're in prison for one reason and one reason only, because they stood up and they fought for the right to work. And it's up to us, we the women, to ensure, not now, not next week, next year, maybe the year after, never to let the people of Great Britain forget about these men, and that's our duty, and we've got to ensure that the wives and the children are fed, and then men have to be freed. That's our main fight. None of this was enough to stem the crisis. The defeat of the miners' strike had left large sections of the WRP, especially the Petro Bourgeois and the class elements in the party apparatus, bewildered, demoralized, and resentful. They had been promised a revolution, born of imminent fascism, and neither had materialized. Their conclusion was that all their efforts to date had been wasted. Capitalism could be lived with, and they could perhaps find a more comfortable part within the existing social order. The scene was set for the eruption of unprincipled factional struggles at the party center in Clapham. Before dealing with the specific ev events of the split and its central lessons, some issues must be made clear. The personal and political degeneration of Healy, Slaughter and Banda, who played a significant and decisive role in the history of the 14th Nation in ensuring the continuity of Trotskyism, has a tragic dimension. In all the struggles which throughout 1985 and into 1986, the ICFI opposed the efforts of the WRP leadership to denigrate these historic struggles. The IC insisted that the central issue facing the WRP at a time of acute political crisis was to determine for or against for or against the international committee, whether to renew and deepen the political struggle that had once secured for the British Trotskyists their position as the political leadership of the world movement, or to continue the international opportunist backsliding. The ICFI worked in a principled fashion, urging the WRP's leadership and membership to reverse course by exacting the political authority of the World Party and working with their international co-thinkers. They were correct to do so. The WRP had undergone a profound degeneration, but as a section of the IC, was an entirely different political entity to the pseudo-left groups. As Comrade David North said during a recent discussion, Healy, on his worst day, was better than the likes of Ted Grant of the militant group and Tony Cliff of the Socialist Workers' Party on their best. The party had within it a cadre, even at the height of its degeneration, that believed in the revolutionary perspective Healy, Slaughter and Panda at once represented and could respond to an appeal to resume the fight for Trotskyism. It turned out that the national political degeneration of the WRP's central leadership had progressed too far to save the party as a whole. But that could only be determined by consistently posing the need for the resumption of the struggle against Pabloism and for the continuity of the ICFI within the structures of the World Party. The struggle which demonstrated irrefutably that the ICFI represented the continuity of Trotskyism. As Trotsky said when founding the Fourth International, outside of its ranks there was no revolutionary party or cadre worthy of the name. The critique elaborated from 1982 by Comrade David North could only have been formulated from within a tendency 
that had placed the assimilation of the historical experiences of the Trotskyist movement and the struggle against the revisionism of Pablo Mandel at the center of its work. It exposed the WRP's abandonment of the theory of permanent revolution, its adaptation to bourgeois nationalism, and the relationship between the WRP's political opportunism and Hilly's subjective idealist distortion of dialectical and historical materialism. It made clear that the crisis gripping the WRP was the product of a protracted political degeneration and offered the only basis through which this could be resolved. Healy's refusal to discuss the serious theoretical and political criticisms of this drift back to Pabloism foreclosed the possibility of overcoming the mounting political problems inside the WRP. However, if one were to characterise the first months of the crisis within the WRP, this was a period in which that critique provided the basis for the crystallization of a new Trotskyist majority in the International Committee. It won the support of the Sri Lankan, German and Australian sections and the faction within the WRP that constituted the majority by the time of the final break with the slaughter band of renegades. As is explained in how the Workers' Revolution Party betrayed Trotskyism, the fact that the WRP did not allow the criticisms of the Workers' League to be properly circulated and discussed indicates that Healy, Banda and Slaughter suspected that its views would find broad support within the ICFI. And this was historically confirmed. Because large sections of the international cadre have been drawn to the ICFI in the 1960s and early 1970s. Based on the British Trotsky's defence of the internationalist perspective of permanent revolution, the criticisms advanced by the Workers' League, once they became known, found overwhelming support. It was this that accounted for the rapid political realignment within the International Committee in the autumn of 1985, which established a new basis for the work of the international movement. These are two uh, pictures of the uh, found in the BSA in, 19, uh, in the 1970s. Well, and one of them is a picture of Oli uh, as a young man speaking on uh, a platform of the British Young Socialists. Now, to appreciate the significance of this critique, one must draw attention to the character of the political conflict that erupted in the WRP and how it developed prior to the intervention of the ICFI led by the Workers' League. On July the 1st, 1985, Aileen Jennings, Healy's personal secretary for 20 years, disappeared from London. He left behind a letter dated June the 30th denouncing Healy for the gross abuse of female members of the WRP and the ICFI. It was in fact a filthy letter that was sent out to the parents of some of those involved. Its general tenor is indicated by its opening paragraph, warning that, and I quote, the running of youth training by a homosexual, unquote, raised the danger of a political provo provocation. This was how Jennings then raised events at, quote, the flats at 155 Clapham High Street, which also opens the party to police provocation. Together with a deliberately created financial crisis, the letter was a political provocation by a clique at the party's centre. Their aim was to force Healy to step back or retire and thereby speed up and reinforce the opportunist term of the WRP. Whatever his more recent evolution, Healy's leadership of the party would never be acceptable to a pseudo left that defined itself in opposition to everything he had historically represented. For the next three months, the WRP political committee collectively, and whatever their differences, 
attempted to cover up the scandal. This meant lying to the ICFI and opposing efforts by Central Committee member Dave Highland to demand a control commission investigation. The plan was that Healy would announce his retirement due to ill health while still being allowed to give lectures at the College of Marxist Education. Banda led this effort to manage the party's crisis, getting Healy to sign a letter stating, and I quote, in accordance with our agreement dated 5785, I unreservedly undertake to cease immediately my personal conduct with the youth. This effort failed. As is explained in how the Workers' Revolutionary Party betrayed Trotskyism, in October 1985, the pent-up resentment of the middle class exploded inside the WRP. Disillusioned and bitter, fed up with years of hard work which had produced no rewards, dissatisfied with their personal situations, anxious to make up for lost time, and simply sick and tired of all talk of revolution. The subjective rage of these middle-class forces led by a motley crew of semi-retired university lecturers, was translated politically into liquidationism. Now, by this term is meant, and this is also uh, just a very important uh, definition, that most reactionary wing of opportunism, which is now broken with Trotskyism, and is demanding the destruction of its organized expression, the International Committee, of the Fourth International and its national sections. The class basis of this tendency is the petty bourgeoisie in all capitalist countries who have succumbed to imperialist pressures and who no longer believe in the viability of a revolutionary perspective based on the international proletariat. To emphasize the significance of the intervention led by Comrade North, I'll say this, the faction controlling, calling for a control commission was a principled response to the revelations made by Jennings that found support amongst working class cadre in Yorkshire, Manchester and within the national leadership of the Young Socialists. But it developed under conditions of enormous political confusion amongst members who, because of the political degeneration of the WRP, had no basis understanding the broader and more essential issues involved. These were months in which every leading member of the party would loudly declare that the ICFI had ne either never been Trotskyist or had undergone equal degeneration with the WRP. Every enemy of the ICFI also came out of the woodwork to insist that their own rotten opposition to Healyism had been vindicated such as the Spartacists who published a pamphlet, Heliism Implodes. This term, always indicating opposition to the struggle waged by the ICFI against Pabloism, was now being adopted by Banda, Slaughter and Company. Left to themselves, those involved in the fight for a control commission would have been incapable of orienting themselves politically and defeating the liquidationist drive of the central leadership of the WRP and their allies in the Pabloite and Stalinist swamp. What was decisive was the ability to cut through the hysteria deliberately generated by Slaughter and Banda and to present an analysis of the real issues underlying the WRP's degeneration that was rooted in a defence of the history and programme of the ICFI. Indeed, as David North explained, the very existence of this critique was a devastating refutation of the argument later put forward by Slaughter that the WRP and the IC had undergone a process of equal degeneration. One further important point. Slaughter and his followers repeatedly accused David North of political cowardice in withdrawing his critique of the WRP which was supposedly comparable to their own silence in the face of what they insisted were political and organizational abuses for which only Healy 
bore responsibility. Events proved that North was correct to take actions that prevented the immediate expulsion of the Workers' League under conditions where his criticisms have been suppressed and concealed within the International Committee and the membership of the WRP. The decision was taken just one year before the political crisis erupted in the Workers' Revolutionary Party. Of course, it cannot be ruled out that the Workers' League would still have been able to find a way to intervene in the ensuing struggle within the IC sections and the WRP's membership. But it can be stated with certainty that this would have proved to be far more difficult. And the existence and circulation of Norse critique was the decisive factor in everything that occurred in 1985. In his opening remarks to the school, David North noted how the American Trotskyist movement was founded as a result of James P. Cannon's visit to Moscow in 1928. At the time, he was deeply involved in the factional struggles inside the American Communist Party. The rival J. Lovestone and William Z. Z. Foster Cannon factions were both looking for support from Moscow in their internal political struggles. However, in Moscow, Cannon, as well as Maurice Spector, chair of the Communist Party of Canada, was given a copy of Trotsky's critique of the draft program of the Communist International that was later published in the Third International after Lenin. After reading this, he concluded that all the issues he was preoccupied with were fundamentally insignificant, and together with Max Shackman and Martin Aben, went back to America to begin a struggle for the policies of the left opposition, for which he was expelled in October. History doesn't repeat itself, but often rhymes. This was replayed with a, to a remarkable extent in 1985 in the WRP and to great historical import. David North's 2014 tribute to Dave Highland explains how in the middle of September, that is the 14th and 15th, comrades Larry uh, Porter and David North flew to England to find out what was really taking place within the organisation. They had only been told that Healy was resigning due to ill health and old age. On September the 3rd, Banda had rung Comrade North, asking him to resume the alliance. This was in reference to his broken agreement in October 1982 to support a discussion on the false theoretical and political conceptions of the WRP. The Workers' League Political Committee had agreed unanimously that there would be no alliance with any leader of the WRP uh, who, had who had collectively and repeatedly proved that they conducted themselves in a totally opportunist manner seeking to use the International Committee to regulate their factional disputes. After meeting Banda in London, North reminded him of the political criticisms made in 1982 and 1984. Banda rummaged to his files and found a copy of the February 1984 report to the International Committee. He accepted that these criticisms had been correct and asked David to come with him to Yorkshire where he planned to meet with Dave Highland in Rotherham. Then, there, at the end of an, of an unsatisfactory discussion, under trying circumstances, Banda impulsively, and for him disastrously, handed a copy of a contribute to, contribution to a critique of G. Healy's studies in dialectical materialism and the 1984 report to the ICFI to Dave Highland. After uh, they left, Dave read both these documents and then the next day called leading members of the faction over to his house to read it, one after the other, in his living room. Uh, from personal experience, reading the critique, not just me, for, but for all of us, was a revelation providing for the first time a political explanation of the split, 
and making clear that this had met with opposition within the ICFI, making a serious critique of Healy's Hegelianized version of dialectics on which so much of his political authority by then rested was fundamental. It was a lot to take in under these conditions, but it made understandable theoretically and politically what was being dismissed by others as mere gobbledygook. After intensive discussions on October the 9th, Dave rang the Workers League and asked to speak to David North. In Comrade North's tribute, he cites a letter Dave Hyland wrote to him in 2005, in which he described reading these documents and phoning David as the most important political decision of my life. It was in fact the most important decision in many lives. Later, on October the 10th, Comrades North and Larry returned to the UK. They had been told of Dave Hyland's phone call the previous day while in Germany and had rung him back. As David Null states, I cannot overstate how critical and important that was. Until that moment, we were still on the outside looking in. It was as if we were political interlopers in an organisation to which we had no access. But now there was someone who wanted to speak to us about the crisis inside the WRP and who was interested in the documents we had written. David Larry and Uli Rippert, the National Secretary of the ICFI's German section, the BSA, arrived in the UK on October the 10th. There they witnessed a party in a state of factional warfare, which is described in vivid detail in David's notes towards a November the 2nd report to the Workers' League Political Committee, which should be read. Healy's supporters on the political committee had voted to invite him into the party centre and, and to prepare charges against central committee members and leaders of the Young Socialists, Julie Hyland and Dolly Short, for publicly demanding a control commission. This prompted a walkout by Banda's supporters, who had also shut down the party's newspaper, the Newsline, and its print shop in Runcorn, Liverpool. He grandiosely described this as the 18th Brumaire of Michael Banda. At an initial meeting involving 25 leading members that night, and subsequently, Banda threatened the expulsion of all Healy supporters at an upcoming Central Committee meeting. He also indicated his belief that there had never been a Trotskyist movement in Britain implying that the IC itself was not Trotskyist. David Larry and Ulley decided to travel to Leeds in Yorkshire the next day, October the 11th. There, they secured Slaughter's agreement at a meeting also attended by Dave Highland that he would argue for minority rights for Healy's supporters. Afterwards, David North had his first discussion with Dave Highland. Dave Highland initially raised that there had never been a Trotskyist movement in Britain, but he was convinced after a lengthy review of the history of the fight against Pabloism by David North, that the fight in the WRP must be waged based on recognizing and defending the continuity of the Trotskyist movement against the growth of Pabloism within the International Committee. The next day, October the 12th, Slaughter, Bander and 23 other Central Committee members voted to expel Healy, but granted minority rights to his 12 supporters. The Greek and Spanish sections issued an October the 21st joint communique, refusing to accept the expulsion of Healy. This called on Healy as, quote, the historical leader of this movement, and as the leader of the 10th World Congress, as well as the most outstanding fighter for his perspectives, 
to call an emergency meeting of the International Committee of the Fourth International, and we will not recognise any other factional meeting called fraudulently in the name of the ICFI. On October the 25th, a plenum of the genuine ICFI was held at which two resolutions were passed. One expelled Healy from the ICFI while opposing the positions of the slaughter bander faction that everything was all about sex. It in, in, instead insisted that, quote, the practices which he carried out constituted an attack on a historically selected cadre of the Trotskyist movement. The resolution rejected all attempts to denigrate the past contribution of Healy and to attack the history and political authority of the ICFI on this basis. It states, in expelling Healy, the ICFI has no intention of denying the political contributions which he made in the past, particularly in the struggle against Pavlovite revisionism in the 1950s and the 1960s. In fact, this expulsion is the end product of his rejection of the Trotsky's principles on which these past struggles were based and his descent into the most vulgar forms of opportunism. The political and personal degeneration of Healy can be clearly traced to his ever more explicit separation of the practical and organisational gains of the Trotskyist movement in Britain from the historically and internationally grounded struggles against Stalinism and revisionism from which these achievements arose. The accompanying resolution of the International Committee of the Fourth International on the crisis of the British section also affirmed at the root of the present crisis, which erupted with the exposure of the corrupt practices of G. Healy and the attempt by the WRP political committee to cover them up, is the prolonged drift of the WRP leadership away from the strategical task of building the World Party of Socialist Revolution towards an increasingly nationalist perspective and practice. It proposed, in a smaller quote, an international control commission to investigate, but not limited to, the corruption of G. Healy, the cover-up by the political committee and the financial crisis of the WRP to which, it, it stressed, all existing charges against party members must be referred. It stipulated, and this is, should be re remembered, the re-registration of the membership of the WRP on the basis of an explicit recognition of the political authority of the ICFI and the subordination of the British section to its decisions. This one sentence was to become a central issue in all of the struggles that followed. This resolution was endorsed unanimously by the British delegation at the October 25th ICFI meeting and then by the Workers' Revolutionary Party Central Committee. Most significantly, it was accepted with no votes against by a special congress of the WRP held on October the 26th and 27th. David North's address on the first day of the special congress, giving a detailed explanation of the political history and causes of the degeneration of the WRP was decisive in securing this outcome. It was a powerful confirmation of the political authority of the ICFI that won the backing of almost all delegates and was applauded even by many of those who later became the most frothing opponents of the IC. I just, I must stress this, there are uh, certain moments that uh, burn themselves in your memory and this was one such moment. Uh, I can 
honestly say it was electric uh, to watch, listen to. Um, prior to that con Congress, uh, the supporters of Mike Banda uh, were going around discussing how the fact that they, they, they'd come armed in case there was any uh, 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 bad business or they were, there was an attempt to block them from the building they had and the grappling hooks and some and such things. Well, they were armed with grappling hooks, but Dave North uh, armed us with Marxism and a Marxist analysis. On October the 26th, the Healy faction held their own meeting at a different venue, proclaiming that a, quote, necessary and long overdue split with Banda and Slaughter, quote, has been carried out successfully. They describe themselves as the British section of the ICFI and David North as leader of the Rump ICFI. The Heliites rejected uh, an offer by the ICFI to meet a delegation led by Comrade North following the uh, special congress of the WRP at Clapham. The November the 9th letter to the Central Committee of the Workers Internationalist League in Greece on its refusal to attend the October the 25th IC plenum stated the following. Such a rejection of the internationalist principles on which our movement is based is essentially nationalism, expressing the pressures of the class enemy. The anti-internationalism which led to the refusal to attend the October 25th IC meeting must be rejected. If not, the WIL faces destruction as a Trotskyist party. This too was ignored. But its warning applied with equal force to the Banda Slaughter faction who remained in the WRP and the ICFI. They had only accepted the October the 25th resolution as a tactical manoeuvre forced on them in order to win the support of the ICFI against the pro Healy faction and were intent on repudiating it at the earliest opportunity. The membership's response to North's intervention at the Special Congress convinced them that they must move quickly. They set out to oppose the subordination of the British section to the ICFI and to overturn the resolution, whipping up every manner of nationalist prejudice cultivated over years within the WRP membership. This took the form of a combined ins insistence that the sex scandal was the fundamental issue in the split, which the ICFI was supposedly intent on minimizing, and claims that the ICFI had undergone a process of equal degeneration to the WRP and was tr trying to prevent a fundal, fundamental break with Heliism. This was articulated by Banda, who in a November the 2nd Newsline article titled Morality and the Revolutionary Party declared, quote, for the first time and possibly the last the party has been split not on tactical and programmatic issues, but on the most basic question of revolutionary morality. The split has taken place on the relation between the sexes in the party. On November the 21st, a workers the Workers' League Central Committee wrote to the WRP Central Committee explaining in contrast the basic source of our disagreement and the cause of increasing friction between us is that the workers revolutionary party leadership is not prepared to acknowledge except in a verbal and platonic form the authority of the international committee of the fourth international precisely because it does not recognize that the most essential feature of Healy's political degeneration was his subordination of the international movement to the practical needs of the British section, 
the WRP leadership is in real danger of continuing, albeit in somewhat different form, the same nationalist opportunist course. In our opinion, the most important lesson of the present struggle that must be grasped by every cadre of the International Committee is the enormously reactionary practical implications of any retreat from the defence of Trotsky's principles and the struggle against all forms of revisionism. To this, the WRP responded by stepping up its liquidationist offensive. On November the 26th, at a meeting at Friends Hall in London, reported in the newsline as revolutionary morality and the split in the WRP, Slaughter publicly called into question the historical foundations of the International Committee before an audience of its political enemies, infamously shaking hands with the arch-Stalinist Monty Johnson. Just as an aside, just on this question, I just wanted to make a point. Um, Monty Johnson, if there's any, if there's, there's no such thing as any old Stalinist, but Monty Johnson was the uh, go-to guy for the Stalinist movement in attacking Trotskyism. Uh, his pedigree uh, not only includes three-part polemics against the Socialist Labour League in the 1960s, but repeated attacks on Trotsky subsequently. He was, in fact, uh, during the war, a member uh, had joined the Revolutionary Communist Party at that time, the Trotskyist Party uh, in the UK, uh, which Bill Hunter uh, point, points out, at a time when he was also still a member of the Young Communist League. You know, a very um, extraordinary figure uh, for anyone within the Trotskyist movement to embrace. This prompted comrade Peter Schwartz to send a letter to the Workers' Revolutionary Party Central Committee that stated, and I quote, made in front of the entire coterie of British revisionism by the secretary of the ICFI. I cannot help but take this speech, that is a speech by Slaughter, as a clear indication that Comrade Slaughter wants to split with the ICFI altogether and rejoin the revisionist and Stalinist swamp. Four days later, December the 6th, Jeff Pillin gave a public rebuttal uh, to Comrade Schwartz without mentioning in an article, nothing to hide or fear. He made an explicit call to the Stalinists, the Pablo, by then the Pabloite Alan Thornet, quote, and all those who were victims of Healy's arbitrary and anti-communist methods to, quote, join the most open and wide-ranging discussion encompassing, quote, every aspect of the movement's history from the time of Trotsky's death onwards. That means everything was up for grabs. The second major plank of the WRP's attack on the ICFI was elaborated in a November 26 letter from Slaughter to North, insisting that the entire ICFI had undergone a process of a cool degeneration and repudiating on the basis its entire history and present day political authority. In response, a letter from the Workers' po Workers League Political Committee was sent December 11th to the WRP Central Committee. It is the most comprehensive contemporary account of the political issues that gave rise to the split and the character and extent to the extent of the WRP's liquidationism and anti-Trotskyism. It contained the following crucial warning clearly defining the central issues raised by the WRP's nationalist degeneration. Quote, the great danger that we now confront is that 
anti-internationalism is being encouraged by the leadership. The national autonomy of the Workers' Revolutionary Party is being counterposed to the authority of the International Committee as the leading body of the World Party of Socialist Revolution. This is the real meaning of Comrade Slaughter's assertion, assertion in his letter to the North that, a quote from Slaughter, internationalism consists precisely of laying down class lines and fighting them through. End quote. But, but by what processes are these class lines determined? Does it require the existence of a board international? Compare com Comrade Slaughter's definition of internationalism, laying down class lines and fighting them through, with that of Trotsky, a quotation from Leon Trotsky. Internationalism is no abstract principle, but a theoretical and political reflection of the character of the world economy, of the world development of productive forces, and the world scale of the class struggle. Herein lies the foundation of proletarian internationalism and the necessity of its organized expression in the World Party of Socialist Revolution. No national organization, no matter how loudly it proclaims it, its allegiance to Marxism, can develop and maintain a revolutionary perspective except through constant contact and collaboration with international co-thinkers. Those who rail against the subordination of national sections to the international movement upon which this status insists, ignore the fact that the price of independence is subordination to the pressures of the national bourgeoisie and world imperialism. End quote. Slaughter has had described North's speech to the October 26th first session of the WRP's special conference as one-sided and misleading. It gave, quote, a picture of a WRP and WRP leadership corrupted to such an extent by Healy that no one in the WRP could or would raise a criticism of Healy's anti-Marxist writings and practices while they denoted, on the other hand, had since 1982 taken up arms or correct positions against Ili. End quote. The Workers League replied this, quote, The criticisms which North made at the Special Congress were by no means directed against the WRP cadre in general. When North spoke of an unprincipled clique within the political committee, he was referring only to those who subordinated questions of Trotsky's principles to the pragmatic needs of the practical work within the British section. Comrade Slaughter was an important part of that clique leadership. End quote. The letter makes an extensive defense of the Workers' League and its history. It explains how its bonding and subsequent practice was rooted in the struggle against Pabloism and the abandonment of proletarian internationalism by the Socialist Workers' Party, and how this struggle was continued and deepened by a tendency decisively oriented to the working class. The following essential points are made. Quote, Theoretical work is not the activity of the isolated individual contemplating the universe. It is inseparable from revolutionary practice. The driving force of the positive and theoretical work done by Dave North and the Workers League was the struggle against revisionism, about which Slaughter says precisely nothing, a struggle which was carried out both against the Socialist Workers Party and against revisionism within the IC and WRP. The struggle of the workers' league inside the American working class were conducted simultaneously with an unprecedented level of international work. The investigation into security and the fourth international 
culminating in the Galton case, produced a wealth of historical knowledge for the World Trotskyist movement and the international working class about the joint conspiracies of Stalinism and imperialism against the revolutionary movement. And the quotation continues. What took place at France Hall was not a meeting. It was a perspective. What was revealed at that meeting is a more move toward what the SWP once called regroupment. That is the abandonment of Trotskyism in favor of unprincipled alliances with radicals, revisionists, and Stalinists of all description. In the present situation, the WRP leadership resentment of the efforts of the International Committee to establish international collaboration on the basis of democratic centralism expresses a desire to break free of the political restraints imposed upon the British section by membership in the World Party of Socialist Revolution. End quote. On December 16th to 17th, the International Committee met to hear, hear an interim report prepared by the Control Commission established at its meeting of October 25th. The report presented detailed evidence that the WRP under Healy had established politically corrupt relations with bourgeois regimes in the Middle East, had cynically used the Palestine Liberation Organization to further money raising schemes, and its leaders had lied systematically to the sections of the IC and to the British working class. Based on this interim report, the ICFI declarates, quote, the ICFI doesn't seek to blame any individual leader, but holds the entire leadership responsible. In order to defend its principles and integrity, the ICFI therefore suspends the WRB as the British section until the calling of an emergency congress of the ICFI no later than March 1st, following the 8th Congress of the WRP. That emergency ICFI Congress, upon hearing the full report of the Control Commission on all the facts concerning these unprincipled relationships, will determine the relationship between the ICFI and the WRP. End quote. The British delegates to the IC, led by Slaughter, voted against the resolution. This confirmed that the real content of the degeneration of the WRP was the repudiation of Trotskyism but the entire WRP leadership. A December 17th ICFI statement detailed what had to be done to restore the membership of the British section, calling on it to reaffirm its agreement with the programmatic foundations of Trotskyism, quote, embodied in the International Committee as the sole historically established leadership of the World Party of Socialist Revolution, founded by Leon Trotsky in 1938." End quote. The ICFI pledged to, quote, re-educate and rearm all the cadres of the world movement on the principles and program of Trotskyism. End quote. The statement declares, as I am quoting, we reaffirm our implicable hatred of Stalinism, from which our movement is separated by a river of blood. Alongside the social democratic bureaucracies, Stalinism is the principal agency of imperialism within the international workers' movement, counter-revolutionary true and true. We stand for the political revolution against the degenerated and deformed Stalinist bureaucracies as a component part of the World Socialist Revolution. And it continues. While defending the semi-colonial masses against the onslaught of imperialism, we stand at all times for the independent revolution, revolution and mobilization of the proletariat, based on the strategy of permanent revolution, through the construction of new sections of the ICFI. The ICFI and the WRP reaffirm the historical correctness of the struggle against Pabloite revisionism, upon which the continuity of the party international preserved and embodied in the International Committee is based. 
This is the National Committee of the Socialist Labour League stated in 1961. Pablo-Ite revisionism doesn't represent and cannot be regarded as a trend within Trotskyism. End quote. The resolutions on the WRP's suspension were endorsed by statements from the Workers' Sick, the Bund Socialistische Arbeiter in Germany, the Socialist Labour League in Australia, and the Young Socialists in Britain. The Slaughter Banda treated this as de facto declaration of a split. They couldn't tolerate a situation in which there would be weeks of discussion on the IC resolution leading up to the party congress and set about making this impossible. Slaughter knew that if not, he would lose the leadership of the WRB to what was by then a clear majority position in the membership and control of the substantial assets of the WRP. Slaughter gathered around him a group of other academics, Tom Kemp, Jill Smith, and Jeff Tilling, dubbed the, force, the four professors. They, be they began preparing the party's middle class members for a split. This also included disoriented full timers at the run company shop, led by Mike Banda's brother, Tony, who was to describe Trotskyism as a rotten rope, and workers who had secured positions within the trade union apparatus, such as Dave Temple, who wanted to end to sectarianism and more of the opportunist alliance building seen during the miners' strike. Mike Banda, had by then deserted his post in the leadership of the WRP to return to Sri Lanka. There, he wrote his infamous 27 reasons why the International Committee should be buried. Banda revealed that he has not been a Trotskyist for at least a decade and regretted the years which he delayed his break with the International Committee. It denounced the entire history of the Port International as, quote, an interrupted series of splits, betrayals, treachery, stagnation, and confusion, end quote, and quotation declaring. Banda continues, it must be stated empathic empathically, nay, categorically, that the Port International was proclaimed but never built, end quote. He attacked the International Committee, of which he was a member of for 32 years, as a grandiose illusion, a contemptible maneuver, and a disgusting charade." End quote. Wanda also resumed personal contact with members of the anti-Trotskyist LSFP, discussions that led to him being invited to join. Slaughter's appeal was based on a toxic mixture of nationalist prejudice against foreign interference, the stroking of collective egos, praise for having mounted a heroic crusade for revolutionary morality, and holding out the prospect of being welcomed into the left slump, of no longer being treated as parias by the WRB's federal left and Stalinist opponents putting an end to isolation and hard political struggle in favor of a comfortable, less exact, exacting lifestyle. This included the ch chance to get on with their various careers under conditions where their contemporaries were busy making, busy making money at the height, at the height of the Thatcherite yuppie era. Security and the Fourth International, as has already been detailed, was a key target of this campaign. The statements produced in response, such as in defense of security and the Fourth International by Comrade North, February 2nd, and post split the case against the SWP, what the facts show, are essential readings. Aside from immediate factional considerations, the purpose of this attack was, one, to, facil to facilitate a political 
rapprochement with the Pablo allies of the Socialist Workers' Party, and to, to work toward the political rehabilitation of Stalinism for the purpose of justifying collaboration with the agents of the Soviet bureaucracy. To counteract his minority support within the party and shift the political axis of the WRP, Slaughter also declared that the WRP had been so degenerate that those who had, who had left political activity were healthier than those who stayed and were welcome to return. Faces, faces not seen for decades, such as Camp, reappeared or were uh, catapulted to national prominence, along with the appearance of individuals of unknown and dubious political pedigree. The ICFI defense Trotskyism reproduces a February 7, 1986 Workers' Press article or a public discussion on Healy's IC by Dave Good. He was a supporter of Banda no one had ever heard of before and acted as Slaughter's attack dog against IC and its supporters. Like several of Banda's small group of 13 supporters, he subsequently joined the Communist Party. 27 reasons had arrived in Britain in mid-January, but it was not shown to the membership of the WRP or the IC. Instead, it was published in the Workers' Press, edited by Good, on the eve of the WRP's 8th Congress. Banda's document was the political basis for two resolutions carried by the majority of the WRP Central Committee on January 26, 1986, overturning the October 27th Special Congress resolution, mandating the regis registration of the WRP membership based on an explicit recognition of the authority of the ICFI. The political and practical content of these resolutions was to declare a split with the International Committee. The first resolution stated, quote, that the IC, under the leadership of Healy and the WRP, has undergone a political, theoretical, moral, and organizational degeneration. That the IC, neither the World Party, nor even the nucleus of the World Party. That the perspectives, theory, and organization of Trotskyism can only be elaborated in a fierce struggle against all aspects of Hillism. And that the IC cannot claim political authority as an international leadership. Neither can sections be subordinated to an international discipline determined by the IC. End quote. Second resolution declared, quote, we therefore withdraw the res registration form of 8th of November 1985, issued in the name of the General Secretary. End quote. These resolutions were opposed by the Central Committee minority, led by Comrade Dave Highland. On January 27th, the Workers' League Central Committee sent a letter to all sections of the International Committee of the Port International and to the members of the Workers' Revolutionary Party. This stated, I am quoting, the two resolutions passed on January 26, 1986, by the Central Committee of the Workers' Revolutionary Party are a declaration of split with the International Committee of the Port International and an open denunciation of the history and principles of the Trotskyist movement. The 12 members of the Central Committee who voted for this resolution, along with Michael Banda, who deserted his position in the midst of the crisis within his own organization, are renegades from Marxism, who have capitulated to the, to the pressures of British imperialism and are placing themselves in the service of the class enemy. Resolutions explicitly repudiate the entire history of the struggle for Marxism since 1940, declaring, in effect, 
that through the assassination of Trotsky, the Spanish bureaucracy achieved its political victory over the Fourth International. End quote. The Workers' League appealed to the WRP membership to reject the splitting actions of Slaughter and Banda and warned the sections of the IC to guard against their attempts at political sabotage in Australia through a faction led by Phil Sanford and Robert Butler. It concluded, quote, unlike Banda, Slaughter and Healy, the sections of the ICFI will not turn their backs on the past struggles for Trotskyism, in which these ex-leaders once played outstanding roles. We will never forget the lessons which they taught us and in which they once believed. But let the dead bury their dead. The betrayal of the WRP renegades has not destroyed the ICFI. Without them and against them, the struggle for Trotskyism, for the development and expansion of the International Committee of the Fourth International, as the world party of socialist revolution, goes forward. End quote. On February, February 8, the supporters of Banda and Slaughter met to formalize their defeat with the ICFI. Their eighth Congress was a shameful political fraud. Duly elected delegates, supportive of the IC, were barred from entering, while Quest representatives from other tendencies were present. The gates outside the conference hall were locked, and 25 police stood guard outside. Slaughter entered, entered the building under, the, under a police escort. Reports from within the WRP following the split confirm why this, this capable action was necessary, confirming that the, the WRP's membership at Biden declined to just 70. The slaughterized passed a resolution declaring that, quote, the International Committee of the Port International doesn't represent the continuity of the Port International funded by Leon Trotsky in 1938, and hailing the Workers' Revolutionary Party's principal struggle against Hillism, end quote. It called for a regroupment of, quote, all those in the International Committee sections who are fighting to defeat Hillism, and a public discussion preparatory, preparatory to an international brief conference of all those who stand on the permanent revolution, the transitional program, the first four Congress of the Communist International before the end of 1986." The bar delegates elected in accordance with the decision of the WRP Special Congress of October 26th and 27th moved to another location where they convened the legitimate Eighth Congress of the WRP Internationalists. The Congress agreed a resolution stating, quote, this duly constituted Congress based on the decisions of the Special Congress of October 26 to 27, 1985, declares that the renegades' resolutions represent a break from all the historic gains and theoretical conquests of Trotskyism, which are embodied in the ICFI, and an attempt to liquidate the Trotskyist cadre." End quote. It made a special point of affirming that, quote, the struggle carried out for over 10 years on security and the Fourth International, and continued by the workers' league with the Galton case, represent an historic gain in the fight against Sunnism, revisionism and for the training of a cadre against state attack." End quote. The struggle against the WRP renegades continued internationally, leading to the break by the Stanford and Butler faction from the Socialist Labour League in Australia following a March 4th and March 5th party congress. The Socialist Labour League wrote, quote, in answering this call for regroupment, 
the Stanford Buchler renegades are not breaking from Gileism, but from the principles struggle based by the ICFI against Pavlovite revisionism, and are regrouping with those who attack its principles. End quote. On June 2nd, the ICFI issued a statement on the Peruvian Liga Comunista's renegacy. The Liga Comunista openly advanced a neo stalinist pro Maoist, and petty bourgeois nationalist opposition to Trotskyism, rejecting the theoretical, political, and programmatic foundations of the Trotskyist movement entirely, including quote, the theory of permanent revolution the strategy of world, world revolution and the dictatorship of the proletariat and seeding of the leadership of the struggle against imperialism to the corrupt and venal national bourgeoisie in Peru and throughout, throughout Latin America." End quote. This was the basis for their own call for a public discussion with all so-called Peruvian and Latin American Trotskists such as revisionists as Hugo Blanco, Ricardo Napuri, Nahuel Moreno, and supporters of Posadas for a regroupment based on a quote from the Liga Comunista, break with an entire period of the Trotskyist movement in an irreversible way. And the orientation towards a revolution in practice, the likes of which were indicated by Marx, Engels, Lenin, Trotsky, the first four congresses of the Third International, as well as the later revolutionary experiences in China, Vietnam, and others in Latin America." End quote. The entire history of the Trotskyist movement was eliminated at the stroke of a pen, with the so-called revolutionary experience following Lenin's death attributed to Stalinism, Maoism, Castroism, and other forms of before addressing the aftermath of the split and summarizing its enduring political significance, another essential lesson should be drawn from the intervention by the International Committee in 1985. The factional infighting within the WRP was intense and over a highly emotive and explosive issue. The atmosphere of accusation and counter-accusation was poisonous and the demands for an organisational reckoning overwhelming within the party leadership in Cater. The Central Committee had lost all political authority and democratic centralism was a dead letter. Within this crisis, the ICFI refused to accept the political narrative advanced by any faction basing its intervention on fundamental issues of programme and perspective. It insisted on the resumption of democratic centralist norms of conduct, not only within the section, but above all within the international. The historic victory in 1986 and the extraordinary att atten attention to the development of international perspectives within a world movement that conducts itself in the most open and collaborative fashion has enabled the ICFI to achieve and maintain an extraordinary degree of political agreement and homogeneity. As a result, there has never been any similar eruption of factional conflict, let alone the development of wildly subjective antagonisms. However, in the course of the explosive political period we have now entered, amid the growth of the party membership in every section, and the attraction of new and inexperienced forces internationally from outside our political tradition, it would be politically naive to assume that such conflicts will never emerge. Educating our members and leaders in how they must be dealt with begins with the assimilation of the lessons of the 1985 struggle. That is, to focus at all times on the fundamental programmatic issues and even amid the most intense conflicts, to maintain the discipline and political authority of the World Party of Socialist Revolution. In the historical and international foundations of the Socialist Equality Party in the US, a further comment on the cause and significance of the split in the ICFI 
explains. As in 1953, the split in the International Committee that developed between 1982 and 86 anticipated enormous changes which were to shatter in the last half of the 1980s the structure of world politics as it had existed in the four decades following the end of World War II. The crisis of the WRP was part of a broader process that was sweeping through all the mass parties and trade union organisations based historically on the working class. Whatever their differences in organisational structure and political allegiances, the Stalinist, social democratic and reformist organisations were all based on a national programme. Fundamental developments in technology associated with the microchip had resulted in the globalization of capitalist production. This rendered the national reformist perspective of the post-World War II era obsolete. Fundamental changes in world economy and their impact on the class struggle were reflected within the International Committee and in the final analysis led to the split. The collapse of the Stalinist bureaucracies based on policies of national autarky, was the most developed expression of a broader crisis that gripped every nationally based organisation in the bureaucratised workers' movement, from the Stalinist to the reformists and the anti-communist AFL-CIO bureaucracy in the US. It was in the orientation of the various fragments of the WRP to these nationalist bureaucracies, and above all to Stalinism, that their ongoing degeneration found full expression and mostly ended in political extinction. Jerry Healy became convinced that Mikhail Gorbachev was leading a political revolution in the Soviet Union. He split with Sheila Torrance on this basis to form the Marxist Party in 1987, together with Vanessa and Corinne Redgrave. Healy then wrote three articles concerning the political revolution as, quote, a process of contradiction, including Skeptics and the Political Revolution, published November 1989, shortly before his death on December the 14th. He denounced in September 1988 the dogmatists who, quote, present the teachings of Marx, Engels, Lenin and Trotsky through abstract references which immediately become transformed into lifeless dogma and the skeptics for whom quote Gorbachev is another Stalin preparing to introduce capitalism as quickly as he can into the USSR. Healy and Redgrave proclaim themselves co-thinkers of the Memorial Union, an organization of a faction of the bureaucracy explicitly supporting the restoration of capitalism. He made four trips to the USSR. Healy wrote in November, and I quote, Perestroika and the struggle for glasnost, democratization, are the ever-changing forms which contain the historical content of the struggle of the International Committee of the Fourth International for the Political Revolution. Now, I think it would be wrong to end on such a sorry note in dealing with a man who played such an exceptional role in our movement for so many years and under such difficult conditions. One must instead recall the very moving tribute by David North in concluding his obituary, Jerry Healy, and his place in the history of the Fourth International. For a long and difficult period, Jerry Healy was a crucial human link in the historical continuity of the Fourth International. For decades, he fought against Stalinism and opportunism. In the end, he broke beneath the pressure of this tremendous struggle. But the best of what he achieved in his long political career lives on in the International Committee of the Fourth International and the resurgent International Revolutionary Workers' Movement. Learning both from his achievements and failures will not fail to pay proper tribute to his memory. Corrie and Vanessa Redgrave wound up the Marxist party in 2004, founding an organisation modelled on the much earlier proposal for a basic rights party, the now disappeared 
peace and freedom. Savas Michael Matsis and his Workers' Revolutionary Party in 2018, together with the Partido Obrero in Argentina and the Revolutionary Workers' Party in Turkey, proclaimed a mission to refound the Fourth International through a regroupment that included the rapidly pro Stalinist United Communist Party of Russia. It has continued this orientation ever since. Sheila Torrance's Workers' Revolutionary Party, frozen in political aspic, still publishes the newsline as a daily newspaper with barely any members, but with some undisclosed financial backer. The WRP propagandizes for bourgeois nationalist regimes and parties in the Middle East, and still insists that there are degenerated or deformed worker states in Russia and China. The fate of the slaughter Banda faction is no less sordid. Less than a year after Banda wrote his 27 reasons, he wrote, what is Trotskyism or will the real Trotsky please stand up? The heritage we defend describes this as, quote, a frantic denunciation of Trotskyism, a belated tribute to Joseph Stalin, and a declaration of political allegiance to the Kremlin bureaucracy. This is detailed extensively in the closing three chapters uh, of the heritage we defend on the general heading, M. Banda embraces Stalinism. Banda's political career until his death in 2014 was as a stooge for the Kurdistan Workers' Party, led by the PKK, led by Abdullah Öcalan. In September 1986, orienting towards a regroupment strategy, Cyril Smith wrote in Slaughter's Workers' Press that, quote, the term revisionist, once a term with scientific significance for Marxists, has now become just a term of abuse. We should stop using the designation Pabloite in talking about the organizations associated with the United Secretariat. It can only foul up the discussion. Slaughter's turn to the Pabloites and Stalinists led in 1987 to a failed attempt to form a so-called international with the Argentinian Morenoites, who had collaborated with the Stalinists for decades. This is detailed in the March 1987 ICFI statement no to Stalinism and the Popular Front, build the Fourth International, written jointly by Comrades North and Katie Balasarea. The statement brought to bear all the accumulated experience of the split, explaining, the International Committee has repeatedly warned that the political trajectory of the Workers' Revolutionary Party would inevitably land it in the camp of the class enemy. Moreover, we have warned that Slaughter has been working with a political perspective which he refused to discuss with the ICFI prior to the split and which he has kept concealed from the WRP membership itself. Without having ever divulged his long-term plans, he has now brought the Workers' Revolutionary Party within inches of a unification with a political party whose leaders are working inside a popular front formation with the Argentine Stalinists. From the standpoint of the history of the Workers' Revolutionary Party, its dissolution into the centrist swamp of Morenoism will signify an irrevocable break with Trotskyism and the rapid transformation of this organization into an agency of imperialism. The objective significance of such a betrayal of Marxism for the workers' movement was explained many years ago by none other than Cliff Slaughter. This is the quote from Slaughter. As imperialism, not neo-capitalism, moves rapidly into its worst ever economic and political crisis, it must desperately suck away these middle-class elements to some centrist political force to deal with that phase of the crisis when new masses are thrown into political struggle. Such centrist forces cannot be sucked out of nothing, as it were. Mandel is hatching out of the kind of, the kind of politics to fit the bill. Of course, imperialism uses the centrist in this way only as a short step on the road to eventual fascist and dictatorial repression. Now, this ICFR statement was only one of many documents produced 
directly addressing the split in 1985-86 and deepening the struggle against the WRP that are fundamental to the political education of our cadre. Many are collected in the fourth international magazine, centering around post-split plenums of the ICFI. The Tamil struggle against the treachery of Healy, Bander and Slaughter by Kirti Balasaria. Michael Bander, Stalinist by David North. G. Healy, Enemy of Permanent Revolution by Bill Van Oken. The Greek WRP attempts a political fraud by the Workers' League Political Committee. Healy renounces the permanent revolution by Keith Jones. An open letter from the Revolutionary Communist League to the Workers' Revolutionary Party by Kirti Balasaria, and many others that must be studied, along with the most essential work that has informed every aspect of this school, the heritage we defend. By the end of 1990, Slaughter had also explicitly rejected Trotskyism, writing, quote, Marxists, having fought for many years, sometimes their whole political lives, to refuting words and deeds, the lie that Stalin and the Stalinists were the heirs of Lenin and Bolshevism, find themselves in a situation where this issue seems to be irrelevant. He enthusiastically supported the US NATO imperialist intervention in Bosnia and later acted as a cheerleader for the Kosovo Liberation Army. He repudiated the Leninist Trotsky's conception of the Revolutionary Party and Marxism in 1996, declaring, quote, the idea of providing a party and program for the working class must be completely discarded. For the ICFI, the split was a turning point that made possible a global renaissance of Marxism. As the historical foundations of the SEP in the United States explains, the opposition of the Workers' League to the national opportunism of the WRP was in theoretical alignment with social and economic processes that were already in an advanced stage of development and which were about to blow apart the existing structures and relations of world politics. The subsequent development of the ICFI was the conscious response of the Marxist vanguard to the new economic and political situation. The reorientation of the movement was based on a systematic struggle against all forms of nationalism, a reorientation with it that was inextricably tied to the development of an international perspective. From July the 21st to 27, 2019, the US SEP hosted an international summer school on the historical origins and political consequences of the ICFI split with the WRP. This centered on a series of lectures on the history of the ICFI from 1982 to 1995, leading up to the decision to transform the leagues of the ICFI into the socialist equality parties. It was an intensive review detailing the development of the ICFI's analysis with regard to the impact of globalization that substantially changed our position on fundamental historical issues. This included how capitalism had been restored in the Soviet Union by the Stalinist bureaucracy, the relationship between this and the corporatist transformation of the old labor bureaucracies, a reappraisal of the defense of the right of nations to self-determination in light of the emergence of numerous bourgeois and petty bourgeois separatist movements, often based on ethnic exclusivity, seeking the breaking up of existing states to secure direct access to the world market and the right to exploit the working class. The political phenomena of renunciationism and our appraisal of the pseudo left tendencies. Above all, how globalization was exas exacerbating the fundamental contradictions within world imperialism, between the world economy and its division into antagonistic nation states, and between socialized production and private control of the means of production. How this was spurring the imperialist powers led by the US toward a new division of the world through trade and military war, while driving the working class objectively towards social revolution. David North's opening lecture, The Political Origins and Consequences of the 1982-86 Split 
in the International Committee of the Fourth International, identified four distinct stages in the history of the Trotskyist movement until 2019. The first two stages consisted of the 15 years from the formation of the left opposition in October 1923 to the founding of the Fourth International in September 1938. And then from the founding Congress of September 1938 to the split with the Pabloites and the formation of the ICFI in November 1953. The third stage has been the essential subject of this school, from the publication of Cannon's open letter to the suspension of the WRP in December 1985 and the final severing of all relations with the British national opportunists in February 1986. From this presentation, I want to draw comrades' attention to an essential explanation of the relationship between the objective developments of the class struggle and the world socialist revolution. This is conceived of as an evolving process rather than merely an end point. North stressed, and this is the final fundamental and vital lesson to be drawn from the split. And I quote, the opposition of the Workers' League did not arise automatically out of the developing crisis of Stalinism, social democracy, bourgeois nationalism, and the global restructuring of world capitalism. Certainly, this created a new relationship of social forces and a more favorable environment for the Orthodox Trotskyists and contributed to the victory over the anti Trotskyist opportunists and renegades. However, the defeat of the WRP and the ejection of the opportunists from the International Committee was not a preordained and automatic process. It was a struggle that was undertaken consciously and deliberately. This understanding of the objective significance of revolutionary practice is the essence of the Leninist Trotskyist theory of the party on which the ICFI is based. We have insisted repeatedly that it is impossible to understand to make a correct analysis and grasp the revolutionary potential in any given situation if the active role of the revolutionary party is excluded. The fourth stage which began in 1986 and which Knowles said in 2019 had come to an end covers a 33 year period following the split that saw a vastly strengthened international committee make extraordinary political advances. All of these were only made possible by the historic victory over the WRP leadership. They consisted of rebuilding the World Party on an internationalist foundation, elaborating the international strategy of the ICFI, defending the historical heritage of the Fourth International, converting the leagues of the International Committee into parties, and establishing the World Socialist website. These advances have made possible a vast expansion in the political influence of the International Committee and a significant growth of its membership. The lecture stressed, in all this work, the fundamental political principle that guided our efforts was that of Marxist internationalism. We insisted upon the primacy of world strategy over national tactics and that the appropriate response to problems that arise within the national sphere could be derived only on the basis of an, anal an analysis of global processes. The split with the WRP and the extraordinary political work conducted since then has proved this. The International Committee is the only political tendency that has the right to claim that it is the Fourth International, founded on the leadership of Leon Trotsky in 1938. The victory of the Orthodox Trotskyists in 85 86 is the essential political foundation for the present fifth stage of the work of the ICFI. This was defined as, quote, the intersection of a new revolutionary upsurge of the international working class with the political activity of the International Committee. The world crisis that we are analyzing is one in which the International Committee is an increasingly active and direct participant. Our work is being conducted amid a deepening crisis of world imperialism characterized by the descent into war and social and political reaction and the initial eruption of a new global wave of struggle by the working class with objectively revolutionary implications that we must lead 
and provide with a revolutionary orientation and leadership. In every major struggle waged by workers, the impact of the ICFI and its international perspective is being felt. The formation of a network of rank and file committees has vindicated the decision taken just two years ago to form the International Workers Alliance of Rank and File Committees. It has, as we intended, created a path to coordinate workers' struggles in different factories, industries and countries in opposition to the ruling class and the corporatist unions and provides the means for breaking the stranglehold of the bureaucracy and mobilising workers on a revolutionary internationalist perspective. Our fight to build a new mass anti-war movement centred on the younger generation of the working class is an essential and unique response to NATO's war against Russia in Ukraine, the advanced preparation for conflict with China and the escalating dangers of a new world war. It stands at the centre of the fight to mobilise the working class for socialism and will establish the ICFI and the IOSSE as the revolutionary leadership of the working class all over the world. However, we understand that the political trajectory of the International Committee and all that we have accomplished depended on the political and theoretical fight waged against the nationalist degeneration of the WRP, its adaptation to bourgeois nationalism, to imperialism, its bureaucratic agencies and their pseudo-left appendages, and defence of the ICFI as the organised expression of Trotskyism. Today, no organisational advance we have made lessens the necessity for relentless ideological theoretical struggle against pseudo-left, semi-anarchist and other petty bourgeois tendencies that seek to tie the working class to the bourgeois order, nor from the internal struggle against theoretical or practical manifestations of alien class pressures on the party. We will develop a genuine socialist consciousness in the working class, build our party and take forward the world socialist revolution only through the struggle for the program and perspective of Trotskyism waged at the highest level. The assimilation of the lessons of 1985 therefore has been, is and will continue to be essential in arming our party in its cadre and enabling them to meet the complex challenges ahead. Thank you, comrades.